Thank you all for, for coming out. I know it's a, it's a busy schedule here in, in the excellent city of Portland, um, so I appreciate you being here. Um, it is really nice to be back in, in Portland. As, as some of you know, uh, I was here earlier this year um, discussing my book, Ghost Map, which was part of the big Everybody Reads program, where apparently the entire city was required to read Ghost Map. Um, <laughs> which has some kind of disgusting parts in it, and so I apologize for that. Um, uh, it was very fun, actually, and we, we did a wonderful event here in the Baghdad, so it's fun to be back in the Baghdad. Um, it, it was a great trip um, coming here this, this spring because the whole city was reading the book, and it was like advertised on the side of buses and things like that, which is a little bit odd. And, uh, you know, I, I would be hanging out in the hotel with a book near me, and, you know, the waitress would come over and say, hey, how do you like that book? And I'd be like, well, I like it quite a bit, actually. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I realized after a few, you know, a day or two of this, I was like, this is what Malcolm Gladwell feels like every single day of his life. <laughs> so, so that was really, really fun. Um, so I, I, I'm psyched to be back here and, and talking about this new book, uh, it's quite early in, in my book tour. It's only been out for three or four days. Seems like longer. Um, but you've got me at a good point in the tour where I'm still very excited to talk about this new book of mine as opposed to the poor souls in Chicago next week who will be getting a very different Stephen Johnson who's not happy to talk about his book anymore because he's said the same things over and over again. Um, I think it's, it's, it's cool, actually, that we have this connection to Ghost Map and, and, and with Portland because... Um, in a way, this, this book, uh, the idea for this book originates with um, the ghost map. And what I thought I would do today is, is, is talk a little bit about how I kind of got to this project, um, which was the longest incubation and writing process of any, any of my books, and really in some ways the hardest. And then talk a little bit about the argument, um, give you a bit of a preview of, of what's there in the book, and then we can open it up and, and have a conversation, which I look forward to. So the idea for this book really starts with the, the process of writing The Ghost Map. The Ghost Map was a book about uh, you know, the, this, this great investigator, um, John Snow, who had uh, solved one of the great kind of mysteries of, of 19th century science, which is where cholera was coming from. Um, and when I had first heard about the story, the traditional way of, of telling the story was that Snow had been an interesting kind of scientist and physician, and a terrible outbreak had, had come to his neighborhood in, in London, in, in Soho, and he'd gone and investigated it and made a map of the outbreak. Um, and the map kind of pointed to this pump, which suggested that the water supply was, in fact, the source of the problem. And thus, based on that map and his insight from the map, that he was able to convince the authorities that cholera was a waterborne disease and not in the air, as the authorities had thought for many years. And the world was changed because of it, because of this one genius working on his own, having this moment of sudden clarity and epiphany, um, looking at a map. And when I went to research the story, it turned out that almost everything I just said was not, in fact, the case. Um, that the story had been kind of canonically told exactly wrong, and there were all these much more complex and, I think, much more interesting um, facts to, to what had actually happened. Uh, the first of which is that Snow had the idea for a very long time. He'd actually been working with this theory that cholera was in the water for six entire years before the outbreak came to his neighborhood. Um, he simply failed to convince anybody of it. And in fact, it turned out that his situation, his sp specific kind of environmental um, positioning in this Soho neighborhood and his particular set of skills and the diversity of his backgrounds uh, was central to his ability to think this thought or kind of solve this problem the way that he did. But it also turned out that he had a collaborator. There was this other person who, who had been entirely ignored in the historical accounts of this, of this outbreak, a guy named Henry Whitehead, who was the local vicar who um, used to you know, hang out with everybody in the neighborhood, knew nothing about science, but was a classic kind of connector who was able to help Snow with his kind of investigation because he had this kind of thick, uh, strong ties to people in the community. And, and it was Whitehead who ultimately found the patient zero uh, of the case, and he was crucial to convincing the authorities of the, of the waterborne theory, even though he had no scientific background at all. And so it was much more of a, a nuanced, a much slower process, and a collaborative kind of network process that depended on a, a lot of different influences and forces very much situated in a neighborhood that allowed Snow to think this thought. He was a genius, no question about it, 
but he was a genius who was in the right circumstances and connected to the right other people. And so as I was writing this book, I wanted it to be kind of a, a medical thriller. I mean, somebody once described it as a Victorian episode of CSI, which I think is kind of what, what it turned out to be. Um, and, but I realized that lurking in the, in the background of this, of this narrative was, a, was, in a sense, a kind of a theory about how great ideas happen and the environments that, that make them possible. And so I started to think that maybe, you know, that I should write a book where that theory, instead of kind of lurking in the background, was, was front and center right there on the table. And so I convinced my publisher that that would be a good idea for a book and uh, sold a kind of very half-baked proposal um, based on that premise. And then I started researching it. And, and early on, I hit upon this idea that it would be interesting not only to look at innovative environments in the history of human culture, um, everything from city neighborhoods to media environments like the World Wide Web. But also it would be kind of interesting that kind of the twist of it would be to look at biological environments that were also innovative. And I had a kind of a hunch that we would see similar patterns in, in ecosystems like a tropical rainforest or a coral reef that showed a kind of a long track record of creating biological innovation, um, creating lots of kind of biodiversity. And so I, I knew I was going to take this kind of hybrid approach looking both at biology and, and at culture, um, but I realized once I sat down to kind of research this that I had effectively set up the kind of the scope of my book included potentially any good idea that had ever occurred to anyone in the course of human history, plus any interesting biological innovation that had happened over the evolution of life on, on the planet. And it's hard when you're sitting down with a cup of coffee in the morning and you know typing into Google, what shall I research today? And, and that's the scope of your project. Um, so it was a little bit intimidating for a while. And I, and I thought for a while, maybe I'd made a terrible, terrible mistake. And, and then I started to think, just to try and get a foothold, I started to think that maybe there was an interesting kind of conceptual way of appro approaching this problem that I could borrow from ecosystem science. Um, and that maybe it was useful to think about the flow of information through a society as being analogous to the way that energy flows through an ecosystem. And so I started to do a little bit of research in, in, in the history of ecosystem science, and I stumbled across this story about uh, the, the, the brilliant polymath kind of scientist, political radical, radical religious radical, Joseph Priestley, um, from, from the kind of 17, late 1700s. And, and Priestley was most famous for uh, isolating oxygen for the first time, um, though in fact he wasn't the first one to do it. And when he did isolate it, he gave it a terrible name of deflostigated air, which never really took off. Um, uh, but what I discovered was, was this other interesting thing on Priestley's CV, as it were, that, that I thought he deserved more credit for, which was that he was the first person to realize that plants were creating oxygen. And the fact that we have an atmosphere to breathe is entirely because it, breathable air has been manufactured for us, in a sense, by these, by these plants, which is a founding insight of, uh, of ecosystem science and our connectedness to, to other organisms in, in creating our, our atmosphere on, on the Earth. So I thought, well, maybe that will be one of the breakthrough ideas that I'll kind of chronicle at the beginning of, of, of this book of mine. And so I started to research that. And it turned out that Priestley had a collaborator that no one had really written about, someone who actually helped him understand the big implications of his discovery of plant respiration and how it would have global implications. And that unsung collaborator turned out to be this guy named Benjamin Franklin. And then it turned out that Priestley had all these connections beyond Franklin to Jefferson and to Adams and was bound up, though he was British, in, in, in the early history of the United States, emigrated and died in, in this country, actually. And I started to think, oh dear, I think I need to write a book about this guy. And so that became my last book, Invention of Air, which did uh, force me to have that kind of awkward conversation with your publisher where you, you call them up and say, I know you've bought this big book about innovation, but I think a book about 18th century chemistry would be better. Uh, and somehow they let me do that. Um, and so that became Invention of Air. And so then finally, you know, my publisher started to say, it's time to write that book. Um, and, and, but it actually worked out wonderfully because it turns out that, that these two books, um, Invention of Air and Ghost Map, are kind of case studies, uh, both of them, of ideas that changed the world and the environments that made them possible. And so I think now of these three books as kind of an informal trilogy um, where you have two long-form narratives in, in much detail 
and then you have this this new book, which is tells 30 or 40 different stories of ideas and and of biological innovations.